All right, welcome back, Ranger fans and Avalanche fans. we got a very special crossover edition for you guys here today. This is John Chick Locked on New York Rangers. Joined here by Chris Maselli and Kyle Sullivan of Locked on Avalanche. And uh, for starters, guys, I would be remiss. You know, we'll get to uh, the big trade that sent Alex Georgiev to Colorado. But I'd be re- remiss if I didn't congratulate you guys at least for mm. an amazing season here. Your team obviously wins the Stanley Cup. I mean, what was that journey like for you guys, you know, going all the way to the end there? I uh, I joked about it several times. But, uh, you know, I was just telling you before we went live that I, I do the Thursday Locked on NHL with Adam Denker. And I told him many times, I'm just happy somebody other than him uh, won the, the Stanley Cup since Locked on has had NHL shows. He's been the only winner. It's been just Tampa Bay Lightning. So I'm just happy that uh, somebody else won it. Of course, I'm happy that it was us. But, it, I mean, in seriousness, like it, it was when you start the season – with, with the expectation of, you know, you are a Stanley Cup favorite and then you come through on that, it's just, it just feels good. It does. There's no other way to really describe it. Just, it's a great feeling. Yeah. And after 21 years, I don't think Avalanche fans are done partying. I know the Avalanche themselves are still partying. Um, I mean, it's electric around Denver right now. Like it's, it's almost like Title Town. So it's, I mean, there's a buzz and I think it's going to continue until at least preseason. Yeah, I mean, and why not? You know, it's the most difficult championship to win in all the sports. I mean, it's been said before, but it bears repeating. You know, it's not an easy thing to do. And, you know, the Avalanche more or less just kind of, I don't want to, I mean, they kind of did dominate their way through the playoffs. You know, a couple of yeah. sweeps and uh, taking out the Lightning in six games. But, no, you know, I figure we can we can shift our attention to the trade that sends Alex Georgiev to Colorado. And for anybody who needs a refresher, it was uh, Georgiev to Colorado, uh, two-thirds and a fifth to the Rangers uh, in terms of draft picks. So, I mean, guys, lay it on me, man. What was your reaction mm. to finding yeah. out that the Avalanche were going to do this? And it also kind of <laughs> paved the way for Darcy Kemper not being back as well. This is this is uh, friendships are close to getting divided on this one. And I'm talking about your hosts of Locked On Avalanche. Yeah. Uh, Ky- Kyle's all our four limbs speak for himself. But, you know, he's, he's more welcoming of this than than I am. Not to say that I'm not. But I'm just very, I'm cautiously optimistic, maybe more skeptical than anything, where where uh, I feel like Kyle is like, I'm going to give him all the opportunity to, to, to be a, a great goalie, where it's like, from what I've seen, I'm not there yet. I need to see more from him. And it's, it's just, I mean, he's a backup goalie, so I don't have a ton to go on. You have some to go on, but no matter what stats you're going to throw out to me, no matter what you're going to say, John, about him, like the fact remains that he's never been in the position he's about to be in. So we don't know. We can throw out all the stats. We can do what we want to do and say this and, and, and say we can talk about potential. And I love talking about potential. Uh, but we, like the, the bottom line is he, he's never been put in this position on a team that is expected to do what they did last year. You know, this is not just going to no disrespect to Seattle or a team like Arizona or anything like that, where he can maybe mold into this starter position. He's going to a Stanley Cup defending team. So you better be on your, your A game right off the bat. And I'll give him time. It's not just like, yeah, after the first month, if he's not playing well, I'm going to give up on him. I'm not going to do that. But uh, I, I just need to see it. I'm not just going to throw you know all my money in the ring and say, like, yeah, he's our guy. Sackick knows what he's doing because he does know what he's doing. Uh, I, I, just, I just need more substance there, and I don't have it yet. And <clears throat> it's been a roller coaster ride for me because I've been a huge fan of the Avalanche backup goalie, Pavel Francouz, this whole time. And when this trade happened, it was – here we go. It's Frankie time. But then Joe Sackett comes out at the draft and says, no, your is going to be our starter and we're going to go from there. So it's kind of in peaks and valleys, but then you see what Darcy Kemper signed for and what that would be for the stable of goalies that the Avalanche would be carrying. It's a little bit pricey for Joe Sackett and now Chris McFarland, the new GM for the Avalanche. I could see the logic. If it stands that Yorgiev is the starter at the end of the year, that's still up for debate because Francois, he's he's been the backup for a while in Colorado, and it was almost his job when Grubauer was here and almost his job when Kemper was here. So I would like to see him finally get that, get that spot, and now we'll have the narrative going on all season, which of the two backup goalies wants to be a starter the I most. Know. 
<laughs> yeah. I mean, you got to tell us, man. Like, like y- y- you know him better than anybody. So what are we getting? Yeah. So I, I think, first of all, both of you guys make great points. I, I like how, you know, Kyle is optimistic and Chris, you know, you have some reservations. I think mm-hmm. both things are, are definitely warranted when it comes to Alex Georgiev. Here's the thing. The biggest thing that you guys and all Avalanche fans have to know about Alex Georgiev, and that is he is two very different goalies when he's getting regular work and when he's playing, you know, once every couple of weeks, it's night and day. He struggles as the backup. It's hard for him to get into a rhythm. And, you know, he went through a stretch this past season where he was so bad. It felt like, you know, the Rangers had no chance to win when he was out there. I think he lost like five games in a row, but then he followed that up by winning five games in a row. And and granted, he was playing sparingly in both of those instances. But earlier this season, you know, Igor Shesterkin, minor injury, was out of the lineup for a little while. Alex Georgiev went in there and played very, very well, gave the Rangers a chance in every single game. And then uh, that stretch I talked about later in the season, uh, one of his best um, performances that I've ever seen him have, I believe it was a 44-save shutout uh, against the Carolina Hurricanes. So he was fantastic mm. there. But uh, the long and short of it is I don't think this guy is really cut out to be a backup goalie. And so if you kind of get into a situation there where, you know, between him and Frank Hose, Frank Sos, uh, it's kind of a hot hand approach. And if he starts uh, surrendering playing time to him, it might not go well for him. I, I think the Avalanche, it would really behoove them. I mean, obviously, Francois is going to play at least a little bit. But I think for the Avalanche, it would really behoove them to give him a lot of slack early in the season. And, you know, this is not an open competition here. If you bring in okay. Alex Georgiev, he pretty much has to be the man or you're not going to get the best out of him. That's kind of the long and short of it. He's far better when he's getting regular playing time. So that kind of goes against what I've been thinking and saying. Because we have, you know, two backups that we're kind of relying on here. And like Kyle said, Joe Sackick did come out and say, you know, Georgiev's our guy. Frank, you'll remain to be the backup. And I was I was saying like, oh, no, we're going into – he'll, he'll say that out loud. But I kind of felt like behind the scenes, like we're going into training camp with a goalie competition. And kind of like what you're saying is – the, the Avalanche would benefit from not doing that, from just na- doing what they did, naming him the starter and letting him go. And I was also thinking, like, throughout the season, we'd see more of Francis, but uh, maybe it would not benefit the team to do keep him in that backup role as he's been and been successful in that role and let Georgiev go through the, you know, the ebbs and flows of, of a, a hockey season for a goalie. Who would have thought that coming out of this conversation that Chris would be the happy one? And I'm a little sad that it doesn't sound like Frankie's Game's got to be played, Kyle. Game's got to be played still. <laughs> well, it, it's it, it's also going to help your give to have that defense in front of him. Like, it's it made Darcy Kemper look incredible. It made Paul, uh, Philip Grubauer look incredible. You can see what he looks like just by himself in Seattle. So having that little bit of assistance might help him out. But um, if it it's a little bit of slack... I think the front office will give him a little bit of slack. I don't know if Avalanche fans will give him that much slack. And I feel like if it's a rough start for either goalie, um, it's going to get louder for the backup instantly. What do you, John, what do you think of the the contract that they signed him to? Is that too much uh, money for three years at 3.4 mil? Is that right? Right around there? Uh, I think it was 3.25. Yeah, 2.524, yeah, two, 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 somewhere in there. It's in that ballpark. I mean, it is a little bit of a leap of faith because, you know, again, when you look at his career numbers, they don't really jump off the page at you. You know, mm-hmm. as far as save percentage, goals against average, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but I know his career save percentage is right around 900. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, I think it's fair. and I think it's a situation where if you're the avalanche, you know, you're almost kind of playing with house money because you just want a Stanley Cup. And, and I talked about this on my show. You know, I I said all along, if, if the Rangers can find somebody to give them a third round pick for Alex Georgiev, I think I would probably shake hands on that deal and, and just let it be done because, you know, everybody knew there was no way the Rangers could keep him. They're up tight against the salary cap. You can't afford to be paying a lot of money to the backup goalie. And so, you know, a third rounder for Georgie, I would have done it. The fact that the Rangers got two thirds and a fifth, you know, I'll yeah. take it. But yeah. uh, by that same token, you know, I, I think if you're the avalanche and, you know, you feel good about him, this is your guy. I mean, pay a little bit more for him, overpay for him, get him in place and, and go for your second straight Stanley cup. I mean, why not? Right. Yeah. And what about his, his, you know, off ice demeanor? Cause that, that, that's where I love Darcy Kemper just, you know, and hockey players have the, you know, the, the view of, of they're so just, you know, monotone They're when they do interviews are not very like animated Darcy Kemper was, he always had a smile on his face and yeah, it, it, 
you're getting guys for what they do on ice. You know what I mean? But for, for guys like me who are watching interviews and things like that, I just hate these deadpan answers, these canned answers. You didn't get that from Kemper. Uh, what do we get, you know, from his, his personality as far as Gior Gab goes? Well, I, I'm mean, sorry to disappoint you here, but he is a little <laughs> bit on the quiet side, okay. you know, very, and in some ways, maybe that's not the worst thing ever for a goalie no. because, you know, they, they want to stay calm and stay even keeled and all that good stuff. But, you know, watching him in interviews and just kind of watching him interact with his teammates, I've always kind of gotten a sense. I mean, I've never been in that Ranger locker room, but I've always kind of gotten the sense that he's sort of the quiet guy in the room, just kind of goes about his business, doesn't really, uh, you know, upset anybody, make any waves or anything like that. And, you know, I think to an extent he understands that, you know, Igor Shesterkin is going to play over him, but I think it's been tough for him these past couple of seasons because, you know, for a little while there, it was Lundqvist and Georgiev and Mm -hmm. Lundqvist was near the end. There was a little bit of an opening for maybe Alex Georgiev to kind of claim the starting job. But while all that was happening, you had Igor Shesterkin playing in the KHL, playing in the AHL, putting up these just insane numbers. And it got to the point with Lundqvist and Georgiev both scuffling a bit. They had to give Igor a chance. And, I mean, the rest is history. I mean, right. he's the best goalie in hockey, I would say. So, right. um, you know, it's kind of unfortunate. He, he kind of, uh, through no fault of his own, just never really got the chance to be the guy in New York. But uh, I'm happy that he's getting the chance to, to do that with, with you guys now in the defending yeah, champs. Real quick, Kyle, before I, I want to cut you off, but uh, it's interesting that you say like he's a quiet guy because didn't he didn't he kind of mix it up with with Tony D'Angelo? Isn't that a, a story? Yeah, he he didn't really have a choice but to mix it up with Tony D'Angelo okay. as far as uh, so we're never going to know 100 percent what happened. I would have loved to have been a fly in the room. I've heard right. varying reports and varying stories of how it all went down. But, uh, you know, they had lost a game in overtime to the penguins there was some miscommunication between the two of them on the play and i think you know there's one report that georgiev said or excuse me d'angelo said to georgiev make a blank and save or something like that and then you know next thing you know they're they're you know they're they're engaged and they're fighting and you know chris Kreider might have stepped in there um but yeah we'll we'll never know exactly what happened but that's kind of out of character for him i've never really seen him uh, mix it up in in really any way like that you know other than that yeah and to kind of piggy off piggyback off of make a blink and save how does Yorgiev sit in the in between the pipes is he one of those goalies that he reacts better if shots are in defense play a certain way or is he more one of those reactive goalies that can kind of get an idea on how the game is being played and how the offense is coming at him and he can react off that or is he one of those I have to get in here I have to do this 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 and you have to play this way or I'm going to start getting frustrated um, yeah, I mean, I, I think he's one of those guys. He's a little bit on the reactive side. And one thing that I've noticed that's kind of a strength of his is when there's, you know, these crazy scrambles in front of the net, he seems to, you know, it's not always like textbook, like exactly the way that you would teach goaltending, but he does seem to find a way to hold down the fort and keep the puck out, you know, on those wild scrambles with everybody's in the crease and everybody's trying to stuff it into the net. He seems to do well there. Um, one weakness that I've definitely noticed over the years and certainly this past season, he if if there's a situation where the avalanche are in a playoff game and say like it's overtime and there's a breakaway against him, just start praying because he's not good at breakaways. Like that is definitely oh, one of man. his Achilles heels. Um, there was a game, I think it was against the devils this past season. It was like a seven round shootout and he did. Okay. I think he might've only let in like two goals, maybe three, but like every save that he made, it seemed like he was just kind of like flailing and just completely improvising and just uh-huh. you know, kind of throwing himself all over, all over the, the ice there and, you know, hung in there. I mean, made the saves and the Rangers won that game, but uh, just, just kind of bizarre the way, the way that he went about it there. Um, uh, but uh, so it's an adventure every time there's a, a breakaway, basically. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. Here we really go can, again. Man. But uh, you'll, you'll, you'll get okay. a first firsthand look at that next season. Uh, right. I figure we can keep talking about this guys, but I do want to let everybody know quickly about, uh, Bet online here. So, yeah, betonline.net is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your betting needs. Find all your favorite sports and events at the number one online source for odds, lines, and games. Find reviews and news of every league, including Major League Baseball, NFL, NBA, NHL combat sports, esports, and even golf. Bet online continues to be the top online resource for all your sports wagering information from live in-game betting, scores, and podcasts that have you covered. Head to Bet Online today or use your mobile device to learn more about the action happening today. Bet Online, where the game starts. And uh, also want to mention uh, Locked On NFL, which NFL stars 
Move the betting line the most. Starting July 18th, Locked On gives you the 50 most valuable players in the NFL from the odds makers at Bet Online. Available July 18th on Locked On NFL, wherever you get podcasts and on YouTube. And um, to, to just kind of, I, there was one more question I wanted to ask you guys, and you both kind yep. of touched on it a little bit, but, um, you know, just the idea of moving on from your starting goalie. And I, I know he got a little bit of a payday, but man, it's like you just won the Stanley Cup. This is a cold business, is it not? <sighs> We're used to this at this yeah. point, like with, with our goalie situation. Um, yeah, I, I was wanting Darcy Kemper back and and not for, you know, any like any any other reason than, yeah, he, he was your goalie that that was in the pipes for your Stanley Cup victory. And and all throughout the season, he had a great regular season. He really did. And I, I wanted there to be some stability for uh, the, the goalie position. Chris McFarlane and Joe Sackick think differently when it comes to goalies. And, and you know, I was telling Kyle in an episode we did uh, like last week, and there, and there was an article in, in the Hockey News that kind of talked about how the goalie position is changing, not in how it's played, but how the teams are filling out their rosters for the position. Because, so, you know, we're, we're no longer that just singular goaltender that just – plays the duration of a season and is spelled every once in a while. Like it's changing. And I think the, av- I got to, you know, again, give Joe Sack a credit here. Like they seem to be at the forefront of this changing dynamic when it comes to goalies, um, which is not to throw a ton of money at them. You know, when you got, have a guy like you have, you know, with um, Shesterkin and with Vasilevsky, like those guys are anomalies. Those guys are, you, you are going to throw money at them. Uh, but then there's just this massive drop off and there's just this big collection of goalies. And it's almost like you can take your pick, get some, some serviceable goaltending, put a great defense in front of them. So you're not relying on them game in and game out to win it for you and see what happens. And there, but this, this is a path that the avalanche haven't been down yet. All of these goalies that are coming through this revolving door are seasoned starting goalies. This is something brand new. If this works, this is going to be copycatted more than I can even think. Um, and I say if it works, I mean, what what would consider? I mean, obviously, if you want to stand the cup, uh, maybe going to the playoffs and winning a round or two, I think people will look at that as like, okay, we can work with that. Let's let's look at this model and go down down this road. I, I got to be sold on. Like I said before, like it, it's new. Uh, it, I, I don't have a lot of experience with it. The avalanche don't have a lot of experience with it, but that's what we're going with. So it, it's a little scary. It's a little nerve wracking, especially being a Stanley cup defending team. But, uh, some of the things that you have said and some of the other things that other people are saying about Georgiev give me some hope. But like I said, like you, you just have to do, you have to go in there and play games and win games. And then I'll be a true believer. And, so your point of loyalty, this is something that Avalanche fans have been going through for quite some time, for almost like a decade now, with just how Joe Sackick runs the organization. Like, if you would have told Avalanche fans 10 years ago, we're going to be winning a cup without Paul Stasny and everything that family meant to the Quebec organization of the Colorado Avalanche, if you're we won this without Matt Duchesne, and then fast forward, Brandon Saad, Jonas Donskoy, Philip Grubauer, like names that are not on this team that hoisted the cup. It, you can see Joe Sackick, he has his core he wants to build around and the money he wants to give to those pieces. And if it doesn't fit in the plan, we just reset and do something else next year. Like without the losses of Jonas Donskoy and Brandon Saad, we probably wouldn't get the Lekin and Manson trade deadline deals this year. So in the moment, it's weird to kind of adjust to, but Avalanche fans are kind of immune to it. Like, Yes, there are Darcy Kemper fans that are sad to see him go, but a lot of them are kind of accepting it as just trust Joe. He hasn't let us down yet and just trust the process. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I mean, it, it's it's tough in hockey. You know, it, it's a very tight salary cap and, you know, you can't really afford to, to overextend yourself. You know, the Rangers had a lot of uh, players that they brought in as rentals this past offseason. Those guys really helped them make it as far as they did, but... As it turns out, yeah, these guys were just rentals, whether it's cop or, I mean, Tyler Mott is still unsigned. It's possible he could return to the Rangers, although I would say the odds are probably against it. But yeah, you know, you bring in an Andrew Cop, a Frank Petrano, mm. 
uh, Justin Braun. All these guys helped to varying degrees, but they're all playing elsewhere this season. And as much as uh, certain Ranger fans would have liked to have seen guys like Cop and Vitrano back, you got to make the tough decisions and, you know, you can't right. keep everybody. That, that's the bottom no. line. Yeah. What I wanted to bring up uh, an old trade that happened. Oh, I don't want to say old, you know, a few years ago yeah. uh, between our two teams. And, you know, it was kind of like a midnight deal. And that was for Ryan Graves. And, you know, he's no longer with the Avalanche, but he made an impact, mm-hmm. especially that first year he came over. Was there any... I'm not saying like he's he's a guy that you look back on and be like, well, you know, why didn't we keep him? But uh, could he if Ryan Graves is still with the Rangers right now, I feel like he'd be a big part of what they do, especially on the defensive end. They're, they're a big, beefy defensive team, and he would fit right in right now if he was still with them. Yeah, I mean, he would probably be in the mix. I would say like of all the deals the Rangers have made over the past few seasons, they haven't really. I mean, if you want to go back you know, a good five years here, whatever it is now, the the JT Miller and Ryan McDonough trade where they got next to nothing in return Mm. from Tampa, that was really bad. Um, Other than that, though, I don't think the Rangers have really been burned by any of their trades, especially when it comes to, you know, trading away prospects or or draft picks or whatever it might be. Um, Ryan Graves has become a really solid player in this league and obviously did a nice job when he was there uh, with the Avalanche. Um, But yeah, I mean, it's not something that like I sit around and like, Oh, I rue the day that that trade was made, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. But, you know, what do you think the Rangers are going to do for the remainder of this offseason? You know, there's still some free agents to be signed. I'm assuming they probably have some restricted free agents that still need to be signed. Uh, but, you know, this whole Matthew Kachuk thing, they're a team that's in that's getting thrown out there. Is there any real legit validity to that? Do you think they would yeah, go down I mean- that road? I guess never say never, but it's so hard to figure out how that would happen. Because like I said, I mean, the Rangers, they've got like, I think it's about $4.3 million in cap space right now. Uh, Mm -hmm. Capo Caco is a restricted free agent. He still needs a new deal. He'll come in at like 2.2 or 2.3. And as far as like trading somebody away or trading somebody to Calgary to, to bring in Kachuk, I mean, you would have to probably get Jacob Truba to waive his no move clause, which I don't think he's going to do. I think he likes being in New York and likes being uh, a member of the New York Rangers. And he is a good defenseman for this team. I don't know that he's always been $8 million a year. Good. Mm-hmm. Not to mention the no move clause, but the Rangers, they have a, a lot of money tied up and, and granted this money is going to good players. I mean, Mika Zibanejad is making a ton of money. Adam Fox is making a ton of money. Artemi Panarin is making a ton of money. Um, Chris Kreider is making a good chunk of money as well. Um, but the thing is like all these guys have no moves. And so, there's not really a whole lot of flexibility as far as what you can do if you're the New York Rangers right now. And, you know, going into free agency, like a lot of people were talking about Nazem Kadri. So I kind of humored everybody and I talked about him a little bit, but I said, like, I don't see any way possible they can fit him in. And I think it's the same deal with Kachuk. I mean, uh, I I just don't see a way that they can pull that off. Uh, But, you know, speaking of Kadri, I definitely got to ask you guys, Mm. still a chance that the Avalanche bring him back? I mean, they still talking. What's the deal there? What do you think? (laughs) Uh, For me, like... It, it's been a roller coaster of emotions. Like it, I, I thought, you know, for quite a while, even when the season was going on coming to an end, I was like, it just doesn't seem like it can, the money can work. And then as of, you know, within the past couple of weeks, I'm feeling, feeling a little bit better because he didn't sign right away. He didn't sign on day one or day two, or he's, obviously he's still not signed. So after that happened, I was feeling better and you're hearing things about how they're trying to move money, which they need to do in order to sign him for the number that he's well, not the number that he's the number he's asking for is out of control. He's not going to get that. Even the number that he, he will probably land on, they haven't still need to move some money around to make that happen. And I thought there was a chance. And now I've come back to, I, I don't, I don't think they want to move the players that they wouldn't have to move, which everybody is guessing is Sam Girard or JT comfort, maybe leaning more towards the Sam Girard because he's got a lot of term left on his deal. And I don't think the Avalanche want to do that. I, I think they like Sam Girard. I think they like the number he's at. He's at $5 million a year for the next, I think for another five years. And with Kadri, while they love him, he is going to be 32. He's going on 33. Uh, what do they want to do? You know, do, do they want to keep the guy that's that's young and still has a ton of untapped potential or give a guy who by the end of his contract is going to be 37, 38 years old, paying him a lot of money. So I'm back to thinking it's not going to happen as much as I would like it to. Yeah, I'm right there with Chris. Like, I'm one of the biggest Nas fans that you will meet. Um, Like, I 
I worship the ground he walks on. And <laughs> like when he didn't sign right away, like right after Johnny Hockey got his deal, I was like, oh, he's coming back to Colorado. And then none of the pieces have really moved that have been rumored. And there's not been really any kind of like scuttlebutt going around that, hey, they're looking, they're shopping. And you're kind of just sitting there. And now I'm kind of sitting with Chris where I'm like, you know, maybe there's the numbers are still off no matter what they're trying to move. Or Nas still has his phone on Do Not Disturb and he's still celebrating. Who knows? Yeah. But <laughs> like, I, the more this goes on, the less I believe that Nas is coming back. And we were just talking about how do you get like walk away from Kemper. I feel like the Avs are going to have to make that same decision when it comes to Kadri. Like, this is a business deal. It's you could do everything you want for the team, but we can't. Like, we have a couple roster spots we still need to sign, and the cap is getting very tight. So. You can't just fill that up with any anybody. Yeah. So you need somebody of that same caliber to fill that spot. If it is, um, you know, Sam Girard, this deal would have been it would have been over because mm -hmm. te teams will be lining up to take Sam Girard's contract. Not only his contract, but him as a player. You know, he's he's a very good defenseman, and he had a he struggled last year. Um, but I think a lot of people feel like he can break out of that and have a, a very good year next year. So. If Gerard was the guy that they needed to move, it that that would be done by breakfast, and and Kadri would be signed. So the fact that it's going on multiple days, where that's what you know us in the media are, are guessing that's the move they would have to make, and it hasn't. I just feel like they're not going to do it. And but there's really nothing else. There, there's no other real moves that they can make to free up that amount of money to get him back. And even if you do get him back, and you still have some more moves that you have to make to to fill out this roster. So uh, there there was a moment where I thought maybe I'm I'm not there anymore. As much as I begrudgingly have to admit that. So, but I I've been surprised before. Any we thought Gabe Landeskog was out the door. You know what I mean? And and yeah. at the last hour before free agency went live, they got his deal done. Uh, we're beyond that part of the, the offseason, but I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I'd be surprised if it happens, but prepared for it not to. And I think the Rangers might. I, I, I don't know. You could tell me. I don't. Are they kind of in the same situation money wise? It's just not going to work out. Because I, I did hear before free agency even started, I was hearing Rangers were, again, a team that could kind of go after him. Yeah, I feel like uh, with the Rangers, a lot of times, you know, different analysts, whoever it might be, they always like the Rangers always come up whenever there's like a big name that might be available. Yeah. I don't <laughs> really know why. I mean, it's interesting and it gets people talking and it uh, it makes my job fun because I get to come on here and talk yeah. about all these rumors. But like, yeah, I, I never saw any way possible that they could bring in Kadri uh, without getting just ridiculously creative and shedding all kinds of, you know, salary cap space and trying to convince somebody, probably Truba, who has a no move clause to waive said move said no move clause and i just didn't think there was any way possible uh, that it would happen and you know the other thing and this goes back to what you guys were saying about joe sakic but you know the way that you guys describe him the way that he does business you know nazim Kadre, i believe he's 32 right now is that right mm -hmm. yeah and you know awesome season this past year but it was by far the best of his career oh, like yeah. is there any like wouldn't there be some concern of like this guy could be a one year wonder and you know he's you know if you sign him you're probably going at least through his age 37 season, maybe age 38 season. I mean, I don't know how great – it might not end up being the best contract ever. He's, he's a great player, but is he going to be great for the duration of that contract, you know, for what, what he's going to end up making per season? I think that's you a know? big – that's a very good question. Man. Like, yeah, this this past season was far and away his, his best. Like, it's not even close. So yeah. um, he did what he needed to do in a contract year. He had a career season, and now – you know, he's hoping to cash in on that. <clears throat> is it with the avalanche? We obviously don't know. But it's a very good question. Does he come back down to earth somewhat? And if he does, I still think the avalanche are okay with that. Like his normal numbers since he's been with the Avs are what they brought him in to do. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody saw this 80-plus point season coming at all. So they got it. Um, they're happy about it because it he helped them win a Stanley Cup. But, yeah, do, do you – assume that those numbers are going to repeat for the next couple seasons. It's a, it's a gamble because he's never done it before. Other than last year, you have one year of, of him putting up numbers like that. But like I said, like, even if he goes reverts back to 
typical Nazem Kadri numbers. I think that's still that's still what the Avalanche would love from him. Everything he does on the ice for the team, on the power play, he's great. Face-offs, he's great. So he does things more than just the gaudy numbers that he had from last year. And I think that has a lot to do with the holding pattern under Nas's contract. Darcy Kemper walking out the door and us hesitating, like giving no time to signing Valerie Nachushkin and what this front office sees of potential and talent um, and what you're signing on for and what you're buying into. Um, it's not contracts are not handed out by rewards. Thanks for getting us the cup. It's what you can do for us going forward, because this is not the end goal. One cup. Yeah. This team is built for years to come. They want a dynasty, not just one. They want a dynasty. And if you're a piece that we're not going to be able to shoulder down the line. Joe Sackick has no problem walking away. Yeah. I, I got a, oh, that- I got a contract question for you, John, because yes, after sir. this upcoming season, uh, the greatest contract in hockey goes away, which is Nathan McKinnon's six point four million dollar a season a- or AAV uh, contract. That's gone, and he will likely get a very sizable increase. I think who replaces that as the best contract in hockey is Igor Shosturkin coming in at five point six million dollars for arguably the best goalie. In the league, and he's got. Let me bring up Cat Friendly quick. He's got so he's got three more seasons left on that. Mm. Fast forward four seasons. What do they have to pay this guy when his uh, next contract is up? <laughs> oh man, I, I don't even want to think about that. I'm already stressed <laughs> about that because I mean, you know, we were talking about this earlier. When you get a goalie, you know, of the ilk of you know an Andre Vasilevsky or an Igor Shesterkin, one of the truly, truly elite guys. I do think you have to hang on to them. As far as what he's going to cost, I mean, God only knows, man. And it, it's tough mm. because, you know, he wins the Vesna this year. And obviously, I'm thrilled for him. And I, I think he was the rightful winner. But, like, it's just like another notch on his belt. It just, it, you know, now he's got a Vesna. You know, you got to pay him even more money. And I I think um, it could be a situation where the best thing that the Rangers can do, when he's going into the last year of his current contract, they should probably sit down right then and there and try to hammer out an extension. Don't let it come to the end of the season where he's – a UFA and now he can talk to any team in the NHL and drive his price up even higher. I think uh, the smart thing to do is, is to get ahead of it. And as far as getting ahead of it, they've actually already kind of done that because, you know, they took some heat when they gave him this big extension, Uh, no goalie. I think in NHL history had ever gotten this much per season playing as few games as Igor Shesterkin had, but I loved it when they did it. I said, they got ahead of this, this guy everywhere he's played has put up video game like numbers. He looks like he's the real deal. Yes, there is some risk involved in this, but I think it's a calculated, very smart risk. And now, I mean, show me a show me a bigger steal in hockey than Igor at five point six six or or some something like that, five point six seven million, whatever it is. Um, th- there's like twelve goalies that are making more than he is. So yeah, man, I I love the contract and man, that that I'm already stressed thinking about enjoy how much it. it's going to take to hang on to him. Yeah, enjoy it while it lasts, because I'm telling you, we we enjoyed every minute of this McKinnon contract. And oh yeah. And I, you know, and some people would even say uh, another bargain deal that the Avalanche has: Cal McCarr at nine million dollars a season. Some people are thinking that that's a pretty good bargain. It is, you know? yeah. I think yeah. It is. So you're yeah. telling me Darcy Kemper and Igor make about the same amount of money right now? Yes, they do. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, that's close. about right. I was. Oh, I, I was on. I, I don't think it was cap friendly. It was one of those you know NHL contract websites, and I was just looking like to compare and contrast the contracts. But I, I swear, I think there's like twelve goalies that are making more than Igor mm-hmm. Sturkin right now. And some of them are not doing so well. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm very, very thankful for, well, for what, well, what you said. I, I hope uh, a lot of our Avalanche listeners are listening uh, to what you just said about that, because that's what the Avalanche are going through right now with Nathan McKinnon and trying to get an extension done. And we just had an episode about that or two days ago about getting it done now so it yep. doesn't go into the when he's an official unrestricted and he's, and he's fair game. So yeah, uh, what you just said is exactly what we were were saying about about McKinnon, and it, it, we think it is trending in that direction. They are talking, um, but everybody's looking at the number. Everybody's wondering what is that going to be, and we have our thoughts. Uh, and and some people are still hanging on to a couple of years ago. McKinnon said, you know, talking about his current contract and how it's a deal for the Avalanche, and he came out and said, "I'll take less money again." Um, nobody believes that. But uh, in the back of my head, I'm still like, just sign for seven. Just just match your captain with with 
you know, uh, is seven million per, and we'll be good. I don't think that's happening. I think he's getting a sizable increase, uh, Matthews esque, if you ask me. So. Yeah, I don't want to see Igor or Nathan McKinnon as a Columbus Blue Jacket. <laughs> hey, you never know. After Johnny Hockey, know, man. Eric, he can be ruled out. Yeah, that blew everything up. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I'm with you. Uh, well, listen, guys, it's a ton of fun as always. Always great talking some hockey, catching up with you guys a little bit. And uh, we will definitely have to do this again sometime during the season. I'm, I'm sh- I don't know when they play each other. I didn't check the schedule, but uh, maybe a pregame or a it's... postgame show. We'll, we'll see. It's early. Well, their, their first matchup is, uh, I think, the third week of the season. Okay. It's okay. in in New York. The first game is in New York. The second one that's that's in Denver. I can't remember exactly when that is, but I know um it's I think it's the third week of the season. They're uh they're in New York. So yeah, we'll definitely do this again. We'll we'll bring up uh Patrick Nemeth at the at the next crossover. Yeah, yeah. We, we were gonna talk <laughs> about the Patrick Nemeth we? episode. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick Nemeth special, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Um and yeah, where man. where can everybody find uh locked on abs and where can they find you guys on social media as well? Uh, Twitter's L O P N underscore avalanche locked on avalanche on Instagram. And then our YouTube channel, uh, locked on avalanche for that. And Kyle has his own Twitter page, which is at shaggy bond. love it. There you go. And for any as fans, uh, you can find yep. me at Jchick 17. You can find the show's Twitter handle at L O underscore N Y underscore Rangers. And you can find this podcast anywhere that you get your podcast. So, uh, again, guys, this was awesome. Ton of fun. And uh, we will definitely do this again uh, sometime during the season for sure. You gave me a little bit more hope on, on Georgiev. So uh, I'm going to hold on to that for now. So uh, okay. Poor Frankie. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. All right. So Ranger fans, as fans, we will see you guys next time. All right.